and I'll ask you. I have to just give you permission. You're good to go? I am. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Talk to Danielle podcast. I am your host, Danielle C. Baker. And before I introduce today's guest, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to whichever channel you're listening or watching from. And today I have an amazing guest. So those who listen to me regularly know I, I, all my guests are amazing, but this one in particular uh, really uh, I'm so happy to have her on because she talks about a subject that is very, very important. And it's all about food inclusivity. So for those of you who have the, um, dietary ret restrictions, allergies, uh, if you're a vegan, vegetarian, you know exactly what we're talking about. So I am introducing our guest today, the lovely Heather Landex. Thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. And thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> now we we know each other from uh, our publisher where we uh, we started our books and I, I just love your book and the work that you've been doing around it but before we start talking about what you do can you tell us a little bit about uh, tell us your story and how you got to where you are today well I think like most graduates I graduated with a biology degree not knowing what on earth I was going to do <laughs> I disappeared immediately even before graduating you know the ceremony and everything I disappeared to Australia you know, I'm, I'm British, so it was a bit pretty much the opposite side of the world. I had a friend mm -hmm. there, so I was, I was supposed to go there just for a few months. Um, but I had ideals of being a conservationist, you know, tracking animals and being out in the outback and all of these things. Um, and I did do that for a while. Most, I did it as a volunteer and then I helped some PhD students and I did some quite cool jobs like possum tracking and tagging stingrays and that kind of thing. But actually conservation is pretty gruesome. Mm -hmm. And I find a lot of the thing, like some of the animals die in the traps or a lot of conservation work is killing stuff like yeah. pest control and invasive, especially in Australia, there's a lot of invasive species and they poison things. And if I trap a cat, for example, I'm a complete cat lover. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't do the thing I'm supposed to do, which is kill it, basically euthanize it. I basically give that job to someone else because I couldn't, couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. So I eventually retrained in New Zealand. I went and be tried to become a, I was a dive master for a short while. But it's not one of those careers that you could probably sustain very long. There's a lot of lift. It's quite a laborious job and you have to have like that energy and dive mm -hmm. in the same sites and things like that. It soon wore thin. So I returned back to Britain and retrained in the protection of humans because you don't tend to control disease and things in humans by killing them <laughs> or hurting them you know right. you know there's some ethics involved there so, so I, I retrained in the conservation of humans which is environmental health and then I had a sort of affinity with the biology background for bacteria and gross stuff study of you know diseases um so I became a food food inspector but quickly moved to the private sector because again I'm a little bit too soft and um, empathetic of people because a lot yeah. of a lot of that kind of work is basically the food police mm -hmm. and you have to like close places down and scare people and yeah. you have to be quite authoritarian whereas I'm more the friendly like I'd like to coach you rather than threaten you with prosecution and and I yeah. think a lot of people don't realize a lot of food businesses are actually criminal because the the standards are that low um, yeah and that was a bit of a surprise in the realities of the job were a bit gruesome as well and not very nice on a daily mm. basis <laughs> and then I worked at the Olympics which is a bit of a highlight of my career uh, that's where nice. I learned I, I like working with people that are maybe new to working in hospitality or new to working food and training so there's a lot of people with their uh, part of the Olympics was to improve the local area and a lot of people got jobs for the first time and mm -hmm. a lot of young people are long-term and employed were working there and that was a really rewarding job yeah. and then I went around inspecting hotels for safety so general safety like fire safety child safety swimming pool safety but also food safety and I did that in a lot of countries I met my husband and now <laughs> I live now I live in Copenhagen with my Danish family I'm now mm. back in the EU as a Danish citizen which was rather <laughs> exciting and then obviously the pandemic hit and I couldn't travel mm -hmm. I actually got locked locked down in Iceland I wasn't allowed to leave I couldn't get a flight out again um, my family was supposed to join me because I was working there and then they were going to join me so my family never arrived that was quite mm -hmm. uh, terrifying uh, wow. and uh, yeah the pandemic sort of induced like I met you and I was writing a book about food inclusivity because yes. it's not it's not one of the food safety standards you don't have to be able to serve people with dietary preferences 
you don't have to even be that pleasant to them <laughs> which in other legislation it's quite discriminatory or not quite discriminatory it's very discriminatory and offensive and often unsafe and harsh yeah so to be a person with dietary preferences is quite difficult and I am that difficult person so I'm, <laughs> I'm best placed to be this uh, advisor to food businesses as well because I have the skill of being friendly in quite confrontational situations yeah. quite often which is which is good because there's a lot of people and you really touched on the subject there is the you the food industry can be rude to you if you are even if you just don't want the sauce with the food so imagine when you're there's some other restrictions and you're only asking to make sure that you don't get sick or die and and they make you feel like you're the worst person on the planet for so or you, you're, fussy, really, or you're fussy not understanding it's life-threatening they think you're exaggerating hypochondriac yeah a complainer all of these exactly horrible. you're just being difficult and and uh and then you don't want to as a person because i've lived it myself we mentioned before we started recording my son had severe allergies that, that were deadly and we just stopped going to restaurants because uh, again it was just like oh they're just being uh they're just being difficult but no i mean even just for, for my son who was uh shellfish and even if they were just steaming shrimp, just the vapors, if you would smell it, he would go into anaphylactic shock. So uh, that's not some, that's not an experience you want to have in somebody's restaurant. <laughs> and it's also not something you want your other customers to see if somebody does get sick on location. That's, that's traumatizing. Uh, so, yeah, you you really touched on something. That's yep. that's why I wanted to Shelf, dive a little Shellfish bit. is a, a famous one as well. But yeah. it, a lot of people, to, for example, pregnant ladies are asked to avoid shellfish, mm -hmm. especially oysters and things like that. And that's a food safety precaution because they're more likely to have a miscarriage or something if they got food poisoning right. um, or it could even kill the mother. Um, but obviously, if you're eating raw oysters, there is no food safety protection there. It's just taken out the sea and fed to you. So they yeah. have, they do have testing and then they can recall, you know, bad batches and things. Um, yeah. But actually I was working in a, because I've worked in a lot of hospitality venues as staff, mm -hmm. uh, probably more than 50 in my time before I became environmental health. Um, <laughs> and there was a lady there and she was vomiting on the premises and she was accusing the premises of food poisoning. And actually it was just an indication she was pregnant. So she was vomiting in reaction to shellfish, not not because there was anything wrong with the shellfish, but just because her body couldn't handle it while she was pregnant. So right. pregnancy is one of these very strict, temporary dietary preferences. I had a lot of issues when I was um, pregnant, but it was more like mm. cravings, cravings for weird things. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was and the I same with I me. I couldn't find decaf, decaf coffee. I was trying to be caffeine free and I couldn't find that here. <laughs> so that, that was a like everywhere I went where there was coffee or <laughs> alcoholic drinks. I'm like, you've forgotten to include the pregnant people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. That's, I never thought of that. But yeah, decaf is another issue. <laughs> people, you get judged harshly on that, too. I'm a big guy. Uh, well, there's a lot of sober coffee. shaming as well. Or if you are yeah. vegan or you're avoiding something for health, like some people avoid gluten just for health, not because yeah. they're celiac or something like that. Um, right. And they get shamed for it. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you're on a fat diet. And you're like, well, they're entitled entice the tweet whatever or not eat whatever they want yeah especially yeah. people are maybe avoiding alcohol or mm -hmm. avoiding alcohol or animal products for a religion they get they get treated differently so there's yeah. this whole level of equality going on yeah yeah and it's it's uh it's interesting that it's still allowed you know it's not allowed in every other industry but the food industry mm -hmm. is still very uh, free to to do whatever they want with it, and so that actually kind of led me to leads me to the, the, the question I wanted to ask you: Is there a, a defining moment where you 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 knew it was time for you to become? I, I would say an advocate, you know, to speak up and speak out for, uh, for uh, about food inclusivity. I think the scariest moment in my life so far. <laughs> <laughs> I was staying in a hotel. It's actually what I write in why I wrote my book mm. um I'd just become vegan and so I was ha obviously suddenly looking at labels a lot more closely even though I'm already 
working in food safety, going around places, you have to look at labels and use by dates and health and safety mm -hmm. standards and all these things. But it never occurred to me about contamination. So although I was already vegan, I didn't really worry about contamination with milk and egg. It's very common, by the way. <laughs> it's like a good proportion of vegan food is contaminated the way it's produced or the way it's cooked to be served to you. It's going to have traces of mil milk and egg, especially shellfish, especially. Mm -hmm. Especially when there's colorings and things that are made from um, shellfish or uh, cross reactivity, which is what I, I also have a shellfish allergy, mm -hmm. but it's cross reactivity because I'm really allergic to insects and it's the same similar protein. So my body reacts to shellfish, luckily not in an anaphylactic way, but okay. I ended up in, in an ambulance, not, not able to breathe. It turned out later that it's probably hyperventilation of the whole an, an asthma which I didn't know until recently but mm -hmm. at the time I thought I had a severe milk allergy because I had a full body rash I woke up my eyes were swollen it started swelling up even more and I had this like irritability and this is what probably I felt like I had an allergy you know like it mm -hmm. felt like itching on the inside my skin was falling off type of thing and I went to the reception in this hotel because I was traveling around inspecting restaurants like this is what I was doing for a living and yeah. I was like I think I think I'm having an allergic reaction I rang this emergency number and they said we're going to call you an ambulance um, and I said oh so reacting <laughs> 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 so this receptionist gave me just a standard antihistamine and I mm -hmm. do have I already all my life have had uh, like hay fever symptoms but pretty Great. pretty bad sometimes but only on a bad year for pollen um and uh, she said, oh, just go sit over there. And I was working on my laptop and I suddenly felt really weird. And they say <laughs> a symptom of anaphylactis, which I already know from training people in allergy awareness. Um, I know there's this feeling of pending doom, like mm -hmm. you just know something bad's happening. So I went to this receptionist and I said, I think, I think I need an ambulance. But I didn't get the words out because I was already like collapsing, basically. And she laid me down behind reception. And it was quite funny because um, my husband had booked the hotel, so they had the wrong name for me. So I was trying to tell the, like, whilst <laughs> hyperventilating, basically, and, and I was swelling up and the, I, my hands and my feet were bone white. So I was like, I thought I was going into shock, but I was, it's a symptom of hyperventilating. Um, mm. So the irritation was making me have a, have slight asthma and overventilating. So I was lying on the floor thinking I was dying, mm -hmm. trying to tell them my name. <laughs> So, and then I was in an ambulance and once the ambulance was there, they like calmed me down and then, then the symptoms started to go away, but I still had this full body rash and uh, I couldn't feel my face and things like that. It was really scary. Um, and in the hospital, they were like, yeah, she's definitely had an allergy. Have you thought it could be milk? And I'm like, well, I'm vegan. Mm. And they're like, oh yeah, it's very common. <laughs> for people yeah. who, who think like avoid milk for, for whatever reason, religion or veganism or just for health because it's quite a, often a restriction for health reasons um yeah that's really common that there's milk and egg in vegan food and I'm like I did know that I'm a food safety inspector like yeah. I did know that I did know that um so then for about four months until I got to see an allergist there's a big long waiting list for allergists so that's actually quite quick um mm -hmm. I thought I had a severe milk allergy and just avoiding milk is not easy especially if you're vegan <laughs> and you're already yeah. avoiding a lot of things um and then it turned out it wasn't milk but I had you have a severe milk intolerance not just lactose intolerance which is mm -hmm. every everyday servers and waiters and things confuse lactose free with milk free and then right. they confuse again if it's vegan and they confuse again if it's non-dairy which just means it's not made with milk doesn't mean it's not it's free from milk right and all these terms are so confusing for people even people like me who were diagnosed late on with an allergy mm. it's just so stressful to go shopping to go on holiday to stay anywhere that's not at home and I can imagine for children it's very isolating and the cause of yeah. bullying and all of these other things and uh, and then the food industry just sort of we have a disclaimer <laughs> so this is my major focus is these disclaimers like, I'm like you yeah. can't just tell them that everything is and everything that is not acceptable because it's excluding yeah. some people from food choice and and freedom from worrying and anxiety and like you said you can't trust anyone mm -hmm. well it, and it's not that they're doing it maliciously it's just that they don't know a lot of a lot of them don't know like you said and uh i've had that issue as well with my mom who has been vegan for uh, 
25 years, 30 years. And, you know, there's servers are still saying, well, no, that's, it, it is vegan, but there's cheese in it you know, or there's, <laughs> may, there's mayo in it. And it's, it's like, no, it's not. They honestly believe that it is vegan. It, they honestly believe that it's shellfish free, you know, and, and um, even in schools, because in Canada, there's this law where there's no no nuts, no peanuts, mm-hmm. no tree nuts. Um, and that's that's the law. Everybody's gotten used to that. Everybody's but every other everything else is allowed. So when I found out that my son had sh- shellfish, I, I warned them and say, listen, some some kids would bring shrimp for lunch. It's mm-hmm. not common, but, you know, some will. Um, and at, at the time, we didn't know if fish was also included in the in his allergies. So, but the schools were just kind of like almost a disclaimer said, well, the law only says nuts, you know, so we wash our hands of everything else, but you're sending your child off to school and you don't know if they'll come back because they, nobody, nobody wants to take responsibility for it. And so it's kind of scary a little bit. Uh, it is like this uh, default that the person with the allergies is responsible for knowing yeah. everything about the food business and how food is prepared and you know the whole food system, supply chain and what might yeah. or might not be in food and how do you know that you know there could be shellfish in a dessert that's right <laughs> you know it's that's right you wouldn't expect yeah or colorings the, from exa- the colorings there those are bad or even Squid, just the, yep. the whole omega-3 fad that came through where we had to have omega-3 and everything and now we had fish oil in milk and fish oil in bread and fish oil because that's apparently for some people that was the only way you could get omega-3 and uh, so yeah looking at labels you don't always see that there's fish in your yogurt and, uh, and the for somebody side, who's a fish, yeah there's yeah. either side of the coin where there's more people with allergies now and they can't figure out why it might even be yeah. air pollution you know or things in our yeah. diet already or too much that's okay. right you know, it could be anything I personally think it's a lot to do with stress because when I had my significant moment where yeah. I didn't know all of these facts I just never thought about implementing it before for myself <laughs> I didn't realize the struggles of the average person with allergies and I was you know happy with these disclaimers before that point it's not until you live it that you realize exactly it. But there's so many like the growth of people with allergies people have been born with allergies now and that's like never heard yeah. of before and and yeah. they can't explain it and the, these are not just you know oh they're sensitive you know like a lot of people condemn yeah. people to being sensitive and that can mean lots of insulting things at the same time but it's, it's like a... if I get a sniff of this I'm gonna die within 20 minutes yeah it is pretty unbelievable and that's why people think it's a joke like people who would just, like a casual student working in a bar is like I'm just gonna put nuts on the back on the counter and you're like that nut nut could kill me and they're like but it couldn't you know like this uh yeah why try it why not just trust what people are telling you exactly I mean there's some people who take advantage of it yeah and they will kind of for attention but this is this is a life or you know this is a life you're playing around with I wouldn't take that chance but But people might believe if it's peanuts and I don't know why airlines don't ban nuts as well like I don't see why what why is that a problem for passengers not to eat nuts that really annoys me um but then it's also people have airborne allergies to milk Mm-hmm. And milk, milk is actually the most common dietary preference. So, like one in five people avoid milk for whatever yeah. reason, and they will all probably have some sort of milk or lactose intolerance. Just be made ill if they eat milk because they're not used to it. Yeah. It's the same with animal products, most animal products. Um, but in children, it's like five percent of kids have yeah. a severe milk allergy. So why yeah. are milk's handed out in skill, schools quite often? And mm-hmm. treated like this very healthy thing and you're like well not healthy for everyone not exactly it, yeah exactly it's not healthy for you if it's going to hurt you <laughs> but, how big yeah. does my how big does a minority have to be before it's just normal that people have allergies like just accept it that's and that's right. where that's where the food industry needs to get to yeah and uh, yeah and that's what I, I wanted to ask you is um because fl- food inclusivity a lot mm-hmm. of people it's, it's a broad um, term, I guess, for some people or everybody has their own interpretation. Some people will just mm-hmm. be OK, well, we, we should have a vegan option in our menu or, you know, we, are we do we have a separate kitchen? Because, I mean, I've worked in areas where, uh, again, for religion, for religious reasons, uh, with the no pork, there's there's some restaurants out there that actually have a separate kitchen where they cook with they're they're absolutely sure that there is no pork cross-contamination mm-hmm. they're not using the same pans the same frying uh, you know um mm-hmm. 
So what is, with your, because you're a food inspector and everything, mm -hmm. uh, what does, what is the term food inclusivity? What does that entail? It's just about including people purposely, have a policy purposely including people who are normally excluded or find yeah. it difficult to eat out. And that can be out, eat out anywhere outside of the home. Like if you're not making food from scratch for yourself, that's eating out because you have mm -hmm. to trust someone else to understand this. Um, right. And I think it should be taught as part of food safety, but it's not, it's sort of an additional extra. So if you have this disclaimer, you've said we can't serve people with allergies, that seems to be enough to be non-criminal. <laughs> and I don't think that is enough to be non-criminal. And a lot of people disagree with me. because they're like, oh, but it might contain, or, and you're like, but may contain is now used as a get out free card, right? Yeah, and I know yeah. in the States, they added sesame to the list of allergens. Mm -hmm. And so some producers started adding sesame because they couldn't deal with the labeling requirements yeah. and in a bit of retaliation as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cause sesame is everywhere as well. And, uh, but we're talking it, about a couple, couple of percent of people are affected. And then there's mm -hmm. a, a proportion of those people are severely affected. So the people who are severely affected need to, you know, take extreme precaution, right. but then there's a whole market out there from a profitability side of it especially for milk, there's all these people that are intolerant or there are all these people that just want to know it doesn't contain it. They're not, right. they're not that concerned about contamination unless it's negligent. But yeah. what's negligent contamination? What's unintentional? Is it still negligent? Because it was it's foreseeable, even if yeah. it's unintentional. And a lot of the time, um, if there's a high you know, turnover of staff or mm. it's a very high, very high turnover of food, you know, you know, like yeah. McDonald's or one of the big chains, they can't trust their staff to understand yeah. to enough to enough of a degree. So there'll always be this human error risk. And mm -hmm. then they're worried about liability. So, for example, a really good example is in the press, Domino's Pizza. I think this is like 2016. That's a long time ago now. They were asked, yeah. why don't you tell the you know allergic to peanuts community that all of their products are peanut free in the states so don't, don't do this in other countries <laughs> this is just america um, right. and they answered because we can't guarantee what our other customers do we can't guarantee our staff haven't eaten peanuts in their break yeah so we don't have a policy that we're free from even though all of our ingredients do not contain peanuts mm -hmm. yeah so that was a very good answer they're scared of liability yeah and it's uh it's, i think it in that case it's a responsible um answer because they they are flat out saying we can't control what people do outside of this establishment and i think that's where it gets difficult to, to kind of control that's where the liability should stop though but that, yeah. you know if someone leaves their house with a peanut allergy they have a level of risk yeah. and that's the level of risk they have when they walk into a domino's and that's you know where does the end when where does the public liability yes, end yeah exactly. and that is a compensation culture problem mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> that's right. yeah that's true <laughs> and, and it's so not like everyone's a certain amount of allergic there's a variance in how severe people's allergy or how sensitive they are so someone might yeah. have an allergy a legitimate diagnosed allergy but they're they're going to risk it because they don't care that much it's just uncomfortable for me yeah. i'm i'm debilitated but i'm not going to die so i mm -hmm. i could take risks for certain pleasures you know like if I'm on holiday and I want to eat breakfast I'll take more risk than maybe if I was could skip breakfast you know for a week right. <laughs> I, can't, I can't not right. eat for a week um, <laughs> but if I had severe allergies I wouldn't risk it at all I'd have to take you know an extra mm -hmm. bag with me with all my own food um, yeah really take it to the extreme especially on airplanes because they probably were you know again if it's not peanut or some of the famous allergen if it's mm -hmm. milk they don't they're like yeah, there'll be milk on the plane. We're going to give it out. <laughs> we won't even we won't even guarantee we're not going to serve you milk, you know. Um, yeah. So I think so. There's a difference, and some I have also heard of extremely good catering companies, like you know the elite of the world, mm -hmm. and they've had cases where the the person's had a reaction to food, and it turned out down the line after they'd gone through litigation and you know basically settled with them to avoid any extreme fines in the UK, especially. Um, it turned out the person had another allergy that they hadn't had diagnosed. And that's, that's like, I've had further allergens identified. So yeah. I thought it was milk. And it turns out it's probably milk intolerance. So that's why I can't really test for it. I, I can't have a concrete piece of paper that says, yes, 
Right. But whenever I've accidentally had milk and I've chased it back, um, I'm very reactive to milk. But it's it's not an allergy. It's not the classic blood test allergy. Um, but mm-hmm. it's probably something to do with shellfish. And yeah. it's crea- you know, if it, if I'm aller- very allergic to insects, they could easily be an insect ground up in my food. Just yeah. the natural laws of nature that you yeah. know and the food coloring up, yes there's ground yeah. up insects in, no but there's ground up insects in our flower yeah because they can't get rid of them they can't yeah they can't yeah. filter it filter out the you know tiny piece of wing or something that's dropped on you know off a plant you know in the natural process it's not neg- it. negligence it's just unlucky for me yeah <laughs> I can't control that so I have to take yeah. medication to make sure that I don't react especially if I'm away from home or and take some yeah. precautionary medication. Um, but I could just be in a restaurant where they've got cockroaches. You know, <laughs> I, I wouldn't yeah. know. How would I know? Or they've put shellfish in my food, you know. Um, yeah, but colorings, that got me. That's probably what happened. The day I had that bad reaction, I probably had some non-vegan sure. sweets that were labeled vegan because I've spotted that again recently. <laughs> yeah. And it was the colorings, yeah. The colorings, especially the red and... Uh... Well, well let, let's not get into the natural flavors, but <laughs> that'll be a different episode because <laughs> that's not vegan either. I saw actually your post on Castorium, I think it's called, or yes, yeah, we've had a whole thing on that, but it's the, it's not vanilla you're tasting. <laughs> so that um, shocked me though. <laughs> oh, that, and you know, I've, t- I've talked to people about this and they, they still go for their strawberry or vanilla ice cream and then they just don't care even in gum or but, but that'll be a different topic I want to ask you as a food inspector do you have any secrets uh that you could share with us that won't get you into I too think much I start I started by saying <laughs> that the law only protects what's criminal they can't make you be kind or courteous right and it's the same with well it varies in some countries they do have this thing about you know if there's a hair in food it's criminal but a lot of countries basically as long as they don't kill or injure anyone right that's legal so you might be interested (laughs) actually walking in the kitchen especially if you have allergies you walk in a kitchen and they just throw food around like and uh (laughs) the level of training that is adequate that's quite often in so in general you know worldwide standards the level of training has to be adequate so what is adequate and actually mm-hmm. when it's when you start getting to the like these big companies like Domino's you know the big huge franchises that are all around the world they do have to meet the local standards as well as their own standards so if you do go mm-hmm. in a franchise like you know Burger King or McDonald's the world's biggest franchises they do have better standards than the legal criminal standard you know so you actually because they're enforcing their own franchise standards because they don't want any scandal or any damage to their reputation but it's all motivated by litigation and how to avoid getting sued and complaints and refunds and that kind of thing yeah but when it comes to it's not about protecting the people it's about yeah. not getting sued yeah this is not yeah. quite the same so that, mm. that's where I go with my business and food inclusivities because it's more more than is required by the law but you're getting right. into customer service and communication and you know be nice and kind and friendly and inviting and consumer experience and I think that's right. really missing for the allergic community yeah. but even any community really where they have where there's diet preferences Mm-hmm. including kosher and and halal yeah. and things and yeah, I think there's that... a big misunderstanding so something's got a label so when it comes into a restaurant it's got a label on it that says it's whichever you know yeah. it's claimed to be vegan claiming to be um kosher, kosher. Yeah. yeah then they cook it and it's no longer those right. requirements that is a huge misconception mm-hmm. there'll be places where it's not because it's just the normal culture <laughs> but yeah. like in the UK your vegan option is probably cooked in on or next to animal products yeah so you are eating animal products and that's sort of that's the thing vegans don't often know and they're disgusted and they're horrified and you're like well do you realize how much more you'd have to spend and how Mm -hmm. how many places you wouldn't be able to eat if you had this no contamination requirement for your food you'd actually find it very difficult to eat right yeah you're right in your opinion what do you think why do you think um that the the food industry is still not really being held accountable for, I mean, there's the whole, as long as they're not killing anybody clause, but why, why do you think that's still 
tolerated or it's still acceptable the burden is on the person especially with people with allergies because that's probably the most strict requirement right not Mm -hmm. dying is is quite a strict requirement not dying is a strict requirement but having your feelings hurt or being against your religion is a different different Mm -hmm. set of issues um I think it's because they think it's the small minority when it's huge I think they don't they don't see these people and the people themselves have learned to stay home and avoid awkward situations because the risk of meeting a jerk when you walk into a restaurant is quite high Mm -hmm. (laughs) or meeting someone ignorant and it's a lot of hassle and it's inconvenient for the people you're with so a lot of a lot of people would be loyal to certain companies or certain brands and even an even a change in recipe could could eliminate you from a whole chain because they've sharing the same machinery and things like that yeah so I think the problem is they don't see this community it's an invisible disability it's mm-hmm. not even treated as a disability yeah it's true yeah but it should right. be treated, it should be treated as a difference like a characteristic difference that you can't be discriminated against especially yeah. in schools and places of employment um places of study like language centers and you know really simple places where you you should be treating everyone of every background and diversity equally yeah. And usually they're very good at that in other ways, but then they overlook the food. And food is at the center of everything. Even if you get to a meeting and there's coffee and a cake, I can't have that usually. Yeah. Or I have to think ahead and take my own my own milk yeah. or my own snack. And it's interesting because when you think the food is an essential need for any human, so we're talking <laughs> on basic human rights, but we're denying that. To some people, and I'm, I'm, I mean, it sounds dramatic. We're denying that, but for some people, it's a, it is a question of life or death. And yeah, it's, it's interesting that it's still people are still not taking this seriously, like a, a human rights. You know, you should have the right to not be sick every time you eat somewhere. Um, and schools, yeah, and you and it's said, a, it's a well represented. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's more than a few percent for each individual allergy. So when you add all the people with allergies and intolerances for for the at least the legally listed because you can be allergic to anything but at least the you know in the EU it's 14 you know it varies around the world which ones and how they're defined mm. but even for those you should expect that there's at least a few people in a hundred yeah that would be seriously injured or die from a mistake yeah. with labeling and a mistake with ingredients and yeah. that information say I give you a list of ingredients it doesn't have to be in a the secret recipe it just has to be a list of ingredients I don't know how to cook it at home myself and I don't want to (laughs) (laughs) but just giving me an accurate list of ingredients is actually quite difficult and a lot of the time it's the suppliers or the manufacturers that won't guarantee Mm -hmm. that it doesn't doesn't contain something but that information is useful for a lot of people people who are trying to lose weight people who are trying to follow a different diet for Mm -hmm. for their health and you know there's diets for everything there's diets if you're got adhd there's a diet if you've got diabetes that you can That's reverse right. reverse diabetes there's a diet yep. for for inflammation um you yeah. know M- ms as well so people are loyal to their diets like help them out <laughs> give well, them that's the information the thing. Yeah, and that's another very good point because there's some people even with the medication that they're taking, it has nothing to do with food mm-hmm. here. There's heart conditions, uh, depression, anything. The, if yeah, they avoiding eat certain avoiding things, potassium, avoiding exactly yeah. the potassium. I mean, my mom can't have grapefruit because she and this it seems she's not being difficult. It's just this is you know if she wants her heart to keep working, she needs to stay away from that stuff. So yeah, they need yeah. to take that seriously. And for children, you were saying a lot of people just expect the people who have those intolerances or those restrictions to be responsible and take care of themselves. But if you have a four or five year old at school, um, how you know it's it's different when they're in high mm-hmm. school or even in junior high, but. Uh, there is a responsibility. Parents are sending their children to school, expecting them to be mm-hmm. safe. So that, that it needs to be taken seriously. And yeah, they have a duty of care, a lot like hospitals. But it, if, so for example, in the UK, there's these Facebook groups and mm-hmm. it's just some vegans that are willing to take food to the hospital for the vegans because there's mm-hmm. no food. There's no food for them. I yeah. went into hospital overnight. They thought I'd had a stroke. It was quite scary as well. Wow. But I was actually very calm until afterwards. I was like, yeah, that was actually quite scary. Um, <laughs> they gave me two bananas for dinner. Mm. And I'm like, cool, I like bananas, but this isn't really going to sustain this, me. <laughs> Luckily, I'm in here until tomorrow morning. I got offered another banana. I was like, no, you're all right. 
that's that's not a that's not a balanced meal. It's same with my mom who's vegan. She just had a massive heart attack, and they were just giving her lettuce. You know, so was, we we make it a joke and say, okay, now you're a rabbit. <laughs> but you know, like there was nothing else yeah. they could give her, and she was even telling them I could have this and this. You know, and she was making a menu for them, and they wouldn't they wouldn't do it. So yeah, yeah and I think the mass the mass nature of food these days, fast food and convenience food makes it harder to adjust yeah. things for people so it's either take it or leave it and we don't we don't have to and they don't have to do you know there's no equal opportunity <laughs> for people no. with different dietary preferences <laughs> and I'm sure in workplaces it causes you know people won't get promotions because they're not that social because they have to get dinner somewhere else and mm -hmm. they inconvenience their colleagues because they have to wipe down the keyboard or yeah. you know not not bring nuts to work as well and I think yeah. that's just a general thing that everyone should accept is just normal to mm -hmm. not bring the things someone could die from into the office. Well, that's a thing. Yeah, that's one thing we had in schools was if it was, I mean, the nuts was ex ex accepted. But, you know, if it was somebody with um, any of the lentils, you know, the, mm -hmm. things like that or, or sesame, parents would actually complain other parents. Mm -hmm. And we were just trying to say, well, listen. If this was your child, how would you feel about this? If your child is the one that could potentially die, wouldn't you want the other parents to kind of, you know, and if we're your child about... kills another child, how do you think well, that will make them feel for the rest of their life? If yeah. your child witnesses the other child dying in front of them, how do you think that's, you know, just keep the bread home? <laughs> there, there, are <laughs> cases, there are cases where children have been bullying someone and they've thrown and our boy yeah. died from having cheese thrown at him and um, someone else had a trick played on them and they ate it. I think it was nuts. They'd had a nut put oh. in their food and they, they were just like, like kids do, they were just going to see what would happen. Yeah, yeah. And they died. Like, that's not the right, that's not what they were expecting and that's not what adults expect. And it's because no. it's not it's not talked about enough at school. It's exactly. a bit just like sexual education. It should be... It's the same sort of education about people's yeah. dietary preferences, people's different beliefs about food, because it, even in a workplace, there's a lot of people that are not invited to things or mm -hmm. miss yeah. out on things because it's out of their safety. And you should be mm -hmm. always guaranteed safety at work. Yeah. But are you just going to be told to work from home if you disclose? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Right. <laughs> and another thing yeah. to point out, though, is when people leave, leave like the custody of the parents and go to university or away from home. Mm -hmm. um, that's when they're at extreme risk of dying from food allergies because they don't want to be the odd one out in their peer group or right. disclose if they go out to eat they don't want to be the awkward one or they don't know how to do it for themselves learn how to cook in a communal kitchen that kind of thing right yeah so that's, that's, a, whole that's like the death zone is like 16 to 25 yeah and that's what people who don't live it don't understand it's it, it goes beyond the food that you're ingesting it's it's mm -hmm was that pan washed properly you know was there splatter somewhere did somebody touch a door handle and not wash their hands you know there's so many yeah it's it's, it, now, it's, a, lot, it's a lot like that it's not a disability it's the environment that the environment. disables them yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of scenarios where that is very applicable and in yeah. the workplace you should guarantee someone's safety and that would be, guarantee the thing that would disable them Mm -hmm. in, in to whatever extent even if it's just like gluten intolerance that might sound insignificant compared to a shellfish allergy but right. it can be debilitating it can put you in bed for a week it can take yeah. all your energy and sabotage a holiday and and yeah, the pain it's, a big it's deal. excruciating pain um if anybody who's had a stomach flu or some kind of bad cramping will then can yeah, imagine no, going up. more sick days and there ends up being huge inequalities in earning power yeah. and you, you can't go to the same vacations you have to pay a higher premium to go somewhere that can cater to you and That's right. all of these things not realized and I think even the government are trying to downplay the actual number first of all because I'd have to do something about it because it's increasing so, <laughs> so quickly <Right. laughs> but, but the data's old like it is hard thing to survey like how do you get yeah. but if you ask people themselves 20 percent of people say they have a sensitivity to food Mm -hmm. So if it's 20% of people, that's pretty much everyone, right? That's like a good enough exactly. chunk of society. But if they keep it at, in the UK, they say 2 million people. So that's like one in 30 people have a severe life-threatening food allergy. Mm. Is that still not enough people? When is it's, it enough people? Well, that's the thing. Yeah. But you have a, you have 
a lot of resources on this. this mm-hmm. I, I'm always, you work with lawyers, you've worked with all sorts of stuff. So can you share a little bit of where <laughs> I feel we like talking about this subject? <laughs> yeah, no. And I mean, you have your book. We haven't even talked mm-hmm. about this, but it's uh, inclusivity is the new. Yeah, inclusive is the new exclusive. Yeah, is the new. And actually, I interviewed a lot of experts, and that was another mo- that was another aha moment, like a cliffhanger in my career. That's where I decided yeah. to do this full time instead of uh, working with the hotels anymore. Um, right. And it, it's because it's so significant. Even marketers are like, yeah, it's profitable because you'll get the person with the allergy or the whichever diet preference, and you'll get their family or the group they're with, and you'll get them to promote you and be like anyone else with my my particular flavor of diet preference you can go here and advertise you and put you in the media for Mm -hmm. so there's some restaurants that have completely banned walnuts for an evening and then they've taken it off the menu completely just because they know there's a little boy in their neighborhood that wants to eat there so he can always eat there because there's no walnuts on the premises oh wow yeah and isn't that a good story and like a fish and chip shop but on a monday the fish and chip shop are gluten-free then all, all the people in that area, like Monday's fish and chips night, that's a very British yeah. thing, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but like yeah, afternoon so... tea in the UK, especially because it's a coronation today. Uh, right. Prince Charles, yeah. So right. people will be having scones and jam, right? This is a very British thing. And yes. I'm like, high tea. <laughs> and it's very it's a very queen-like thing to do. You know, like this is this is how we'd imagine his mother was, was, yes. was eating, right? Mm-hmm. But it's so easy to make a scone or a scone depending where you're from mm-hmm. in the country um <laughs> without butter like it's yeah. just it, and it even looks and tastes the same depending obviously mm-hmm. there's differences in the, the alternatives yeah. you use but you're like can you not just offer that it's the same as like can you not just offer a gluten-free one yeah it can even be something you have in the freezer just for that person to be included in this celebration exactly yeah it's that simple and it does make a difference and like you say it's it's a it's a market that if somebody knows that people are going out of their way for them to be able to eat that the word mouth is going to is going to be so much more effective than any advertising you would put out um but yeah it's it's i take so many pictures of food it's unbelievable mm. <laughs> like look at this amazing vegan option and then usually yes. if it, it's a vegan option that's also milk free i'm like wow and uh, and it's like it might, if it's something that's not expected like it's not just fake meat because yeah. there's a, I always get asked this question I've even got very insulted sometimes because I'm like I know what you're going to ask me is why do vegans eat fake meat and why do they want it to be fake you're like if there was an alternative I would take it <laughs> it's right. not my favorite thing to eat the thing I'm not used to eating and even when I was a meat eater I only really ate chicken so it's only the protein I'm trying to replace it's not I don't mm-hmm. need anything bleeding thank you I never yeah. appreciated it bleeding in the first place. That's right. You don't appreciate the taste, but the people that are making this food just automatically assumes that you'd want a bacon flavored something, you know, what you're thinking. And it's like even, even people who can't swallow, you know, or people who haven't yeah. have lost a few teeth. Like they yeah. might need something softer than usual, or you know, they might need the That's vegetables it. cooked a bit longer. If you yeah. make that exception, I know it takes more effort and it's a disruption of service and it takes everything on the table for everyone might take longer. But you can ask them if that's acceptable if they want, you know, there's things you can do to make yeah. it very nice for everyone. And because you made that exception, you're then remarkable compared to right. your competition. Exactly. That's what makes you stand out from everyone. But if I'm a general food, in, so say I'm a food safety auditor, which is like the private sector for, you know, mm-hmm. hotel chains or franchises, I'm not, I'm not hired to talk about vegan analogies. I'm hired to do this checklist. It's a bit more complicated than that because you have yeah. to assess things um, based compared to a set of standards, but it's not mentioned. So if I tell um, someone who's taking orders Let's just say a McDonald's type scenario. I haven't worked at McDonald's, so I can say that. Yeah. <laughs> and they're probably the best in the world for their training, actually, but <laughs> which you wouldn't expect, but it's true. Um, yeah. Because they, they have such a, a huge reliance on like yeah. high, high level training. Um, but say they weren't trained to know the difference between milk free and vegan. I'll just mm-hmm. casually ask them, like, Oh, if I had a milk allergy, which I do, <laughs> um, could I have the vegan option? And if they say, yeah, I'm like, that's so dangerous. And it, yeah. it happens so often. Yeah. It's the norm. It's the norm. They make that mistake. Right. So that's, that's why I have to like harp on about it so much. 
<laughs> in yeah. my book and on my yeah. I have a blog as well I have I have um free resources on my website as well so mm -hmm. if you need to know this because it's a shock to the you know yeah if you need to process this a bit more it's explained yes. fully in the free resources and the concept of food inclusivity and yeah and the different terms about free from allergens and then non-dairy and the sort of things that people confuse easily yeah we can add that at the end of the uh at the end of the episode, we could just uh, redirect people to your your resources so they can do that. Oh, my website's just my name. So it's just yeah. heatherlandex.com okay. and, and everything should should, should pop up. <laughs> text, not my, text, not my forte, but it should all be there. Otherwise, I'm, just on, I'm on LinkedIn quite a lot and I put a lot of things there, especially as they happen. That's where yes. I like to report it because there's a lot of food safety officers there. Yeah. And obviously, I'm a new flavor of food safety officer. <laughs> <laughs> and I like I like how you post you you'll even post the product where you'd be like look what I found this is amazing and then so people can actually look okay. for that label and say okay I can I'm, it's safe for me to to uh to go there um, there's a whole yeah. sustainability angle as well so if they if they have vegan options or plant-based options yeah. they usually have a very good sustainability approach to it and how much carbon they've saved by <laughs> switching out the the meat for I don't right. know, some fake meat or avocados. And then people have a debate about avocados and it's, it's always like, wait, what do you want to debate? Do you want to debate? <laughs> who's That's producing super... the most carbon? Who's using the most water? Yeah, yeah. There's that whole other side of it, yeah. Uh, how is your work received in the food industry? I can imagine that, you know, when you're starting to, to hold a mirror in front of... Mm -hmm all these people some of them may actually be interested and say wow thank you I, you know i didn't know where to get this information and some people may because they can be rude and mm -hmm. uh, and mean and nasty how is it received when you approach people with, uh, with you get your... the, it does polarize people i yeah. try well i do like to explain until they're persuaded so i am working <laughs> on the whole industry all at once but usually right. usually you met with um because I have a food, you know, ex-food police background, I'm vegan, I have allergies, I'm usually met with disdain. <laughs> like they don't, I'm not their favorite person. I'm their most difficult customer. I'm the person that comes in and costs them time and can find them and, you know, right. usually has a bit of an authoritarian role. But once they meet me, I'm quite friendly. It's better mm -hmm. to have me on your side. Yes. So you can ask me questions rather than going to the authority yeah. and rather than having a complainer. Because if you've already injured someone, they're not going to talk to you in the same way that I might, mm -hmm. um, you know, preventatively. So it's a bit like the holistic health healthcare system, yeah. you know, <laughs> and the prevention rather than mm -hmm. the rather than the cure to if it's or if you've already injured someone, it's too late. But you can there's so much you yeah. can do with communication that's nothing to do with compliance. Mm -hmm. There's so yeah. much in communi communication communication and customer service that you can save yourself time and yourself more money and all these mm -hmm. all these very logical business issues so once right. I break down that initial shock of oh god she's one of those <laughs> 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 then, they, then they usually see um there's, there's two ways of doing it they either have no idea what I'm talking about and then yeah. it's like a like coat from basic food safety up to what's food inclusivity and allergy management or yeah. they're the other way and they're so scared of liability they don't they don't do anything different to the status quo mm -hmm. so there's a lot of places yeah. that they have like legal advisors that just copy paste these it's a bit like having a cookie policy on a website you can have one that's relevant or you can have one that's just cut and pasted from a legal website that's um, right. but what I'm saying is to provide more than that mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and once they get to know you, because I know you, we get to sound like this. You said, "Oh no, she's yeah. one of those," but no, you're you're more than that. You're I not need to that do more all. like this. Yeah, thanks for that. Because yeah. I do need to do more of these like nice chats with people, and it is logical. It it's is. Profit, it's profitable. Yeah, and then, and it's very and then, kind, and a lot of people have the right intentions already. Yeah, when people are open to that conversation, they get to see how important it is. They see a different side of it that they wouldn't have seen before. And that's why I appreciate the work that you do, because you're not doing it just to be like, you know, I have rights or nothing. I mean, you do, but it's more than that. It's educating people on a topic that nobody has uh, information about or, or realize how important it is. Um, there is a question I need to ask you. I try to stay on track 
uh, when I do these interviews is I shall keep it on the topic, but you said something earlier and my, my mind is just like, I need to know more. So this is my own personal question. It has nothing to do with our listeners. I'm sure some of them will. You mentioned you were a possum tracker <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I and the stingray tag and, and all of that, but possum tracker, can you please tell me a little bit more about that? And how does yeah, that look literally like? I used to track possums with a, ra- so they'd have a little collar, mm-hmm. they have a little radio collar and I'd go track them at night in the middle of the, I'd be in the woods in uh, Australia <laughs> and there's two types of possums and we were trying to track if like one's, one's the bad guy and one's the native, you know, like. Okay. There's the big possums and then there's the soft, like a lot of the Australian marsupials are a bit vulnerable to okay. invasive okay. species. And occasionally we'd find a snake instead of a possum. And it'd been, we only found a radio collar. <gasps> yeah. And then, so, okay, been... so, so sometimes we'd just track them, see where they are and see how many mm-hmm. there are and that kind of thing in their behaviours. Other times we'd trap them and check, do a health check because I was working with a veterinarian, so I, I didn't do any of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you're... Yeah, Sometimes you're weighing them and that kind of thing. That's quite nice. But I also did lizards and small mammals, like uh, the equivalent mm-hmm. of a of a mouse, but more marsupials. Oh, I'll give you the Australian names because they sound really weird. Um, <laughs> but I like handling animals. Yeah. Um, even wild animals, like, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> like they're going to try and kill you, but it doesn't bother me. <laughs> but I can't. I can't. I'm really. I'm really like sentimental. I can't. What's what's the word? I'm too empathetic for the animal. Yeah. I can't like uh, you know chip them, and I had to put microchips in. And um, with with things like lizards, you actually amputate a toe and things like that to to tag them, so that wow. you've already you've already collected them, so you know that which one it is. It's like a numbering system. It's so gross. I couldn't take it. I just felt too guilty. Yeah. And with ting- stingrays, you'd actually use a harpoon, and it attaches a tracker on them. And it, it's because not much is known about their effects of, because because the shark species in Australia are getting killed off, really, from fishing, but also because people don't like sharks because they eat humans. Right. It's only actually a couple of people a year, <laughs> right. and it's not it's not the sharks you'd think of, like great whites or anything, you know. So there's all, yeah, it is a predator species, but humans kill more humans than sharks. And exactly. we don't go around killing, killing them. We're, um, we're not exactly just because we but, see them down on the street. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like on the. Sometimes I was attached to the back of a boat, looking for stingrays, and then we'd harpoon them with a. They have like a little tag on the outside, and some of them you would ca- catch them with a big net, and then yeah. they. I didn't like doing this either because they they usually tag them in some way. And sometimes they put them inside, like they put a thing inside them because they have quite a big body cavity. But if you turn a stingray upside down, it goes to sleep. It's like an Easter That is so cool. Did you not know? It's quite cool to watch, but it's also pretty gruesome in parts. Because you always have an influence on how much they're vulnerable if you've tagged them in some way or or scared them. (laughs) Right, right. And that's yeah. that's the hard part for me too. Like I, I'm the same as you. Yeah. I've had to do. I've done some work with uh, uh, controlling fish population, and uh, we'd have to catch fish, and then we'd have to clip part of their fins so we knew that they had been caught, so mm-hmm. we weren't counting the same fish over and over. And just that, just to clip a, a little part off the fin, the dorsal <laughs> fin, it, it it hurt me. So I can't I can't imagine harpooning <laughs> a stingray, or uh, yeah, that's it's. A different kind of work I, mean, I can't do I wouldn't be able to do it but the environment like coral reefs and it's it was all a protected area so it was just me on this little boat with another diver and right that was pretty cool that is pretty cool <laughs> just to see yeah. the the wildlife yeah that's quite the experience I'm, I I love it um is and the there aim any... of the project was to see if it was a good thing that there were more stingrays or a bad thing that there were more stingrays oh, okay. but yeah they didn't tell me the full work. extent. They do end up culling some of them, and I no, I didn't want to know that. If I'd have known that, I probably wouldn't have done it. But I had right. to like be able to rescue the other person in a remote mm-hmm. boat and drive a boat and learn all these skills for oxygen and you know all of that learning is quite it's quite cool. Yeah, yeah, that's quite the life. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You you've you've studied food at every angle. <laughs> I'm allergic to I'm allergic to insects. It's no surprise after 
Right. I've been bitten by so many things. <laughs> and you were in Australia <laughs> and you're allergic to insects. Yeah, yeah I got that's... bitten by a redback. Have you heard of a redback? It's not the most poisonous spider. But no, it, but it, I've heard it of it. It gave them. me a really, really sore leg. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's un- uh, incredible. And you've been stranded in Iceland. That's just like you've had both extremes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, pandemic. Yes, that was, that was stressful in another way because oh, I didn't know how I could get home. And my children were quite young, you know, a few years ago. They're only... Yeah. Uh, starting school now so quite oh, wow that's incredible I like to ask this question to my guests when they come on is is there any advice that you wish you would have had sooner in your life just to make your life a little easier is there any wisdom or advice I think I, I would have liked the confidence to advocate for myself I think I always just uh so for example if I was at school with allergies there's so much I could have done for myself that would have helped myself not suffer so much and I think uh I needed to rebel younger (laughs) against the status quo. You know, go and study the thing you want to study. Don't go study the thing that will get you the job because you'll lose interest after 10 years anyway. (laughs) Yeah, that is so true. And trial and error has worked for me. Like I started out in biology, came back around to environmental health in people, and now I'm doing something very specific and something I'm very passionate about. Yeah. That's the way it's supposed to go, not like do the job for 40 years, retire, and then you die, you know, like, I don't think yeah. do <laughs> don't do that. No, I, be- <laughs> I believe that too, we evolve as a person. So what we are interested in would also evolve. Um, and I think you mentioned a lot of people are stressed, you know, and it causes effects on their health. But I think that has a lot to do with it as well. We're just so programmed to say, oh, stick to it. It's a good job. You know, you have benefits, you have this and that, but I'm miserable, you know, <laughs> and you just... And I think- especially in relation to the pandemic even just being sedentary and sitting in an office you know sitting on zoom like we are now for too many hours a day is like as bad as smoking that's going to be the next thing that we need to like work or we're going to have to all work on treadmills and that's right that'll be the next thing and (laughs) actually yeah it's probably the first generation ever that because of technology and things like that that the youngest generation probably knows more than the elders now that's quite mind-boggling yeah, and then even for mental health, and the, they're they're definitely more. I've noticed that with the, I don't like to call them the younger generation, but uh, the ones who take over from from us is they're definitely more in tune with how they're feeling, and they're able to speak up. We just have to tough it out. But uh, yeah, the standing desks are already a thing. You know, the sitting on a rolling ball. We we're already starting all of that, so it'll be interesting ten years from now to see what what will happen. Uh, how do you find balance in your life? You're you're everywhere. Like you were. I don't everywhere think I do. Do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a problem. It is. Yeah. There's, there's not much of a barrier between my professional and personal yeah. life, and I'm working yeah. on it. <laughs> and I'm trying yeah. to do more things that you know, using technology and marketing and all these. I'm on a huge learning curve with how to reach more people and do less hours in that effort. You know. Yeah. That's I'll probably always to... talk a lot, though. That's probably <laughs> going to be a consistent thing. <laughs> That's okay. I should do more, pod- do more podcasts. <laughs> you do. You should. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> it helps with that. And I like that. The fact that you, because a lot of people will say that. They'll talk about everything that they, they do. But sometimes you're just like, I I need to readjust. You know, like I, I'm, this, I'm at that same point right now where work and, and home life is kind of, jumbled up again so I need to to but yeah you need to take inventory once in a while and make sure you're still on track yeah, yeah. and I think you sometimes prioritize the adventure and the fun and the unknown yeah because there's loads more uncertainty than there was three years ago yeah oh yeah absolutely yeah and I have to learn how to model it for my kids because mm-hmm. I don't know yeah my parents didn't model it for me because they had yeah. you know standard job nine to five in the UK that's it for 30, 35 years, you know, and that's what they expected us to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They still don't understand. I know I have those conversations with my parents. They still don't understand the, like the way we have to do things now. And then it's like. You can learn in so many different ways now. You don't have to rely yeah. on school. If yeah. school doesn't suit you, you can still learn and be good at something. And you could probably learn in a more beneficial way. That's the way I feel. And I, I feel bad. I'm in, I'm in the education sector, but I will be the first one to say, and I'll, I always told my children, do what feels right for you. Cause I, I understand what that's like to, 
stress yourself out, go through anxiety and, and all of that and still not use your degree. You know, I'm the same. I have a bachelor's in physics and uh, I am nowhere near that right now. <laughs> I still love science, but. Uh, I've seen some of your videos teaching children about science though. So. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah. that will always You've still be got a skill. Thing. I, that will still, that will be the best decision I've ever made was to teach children about physics and sciences. That's awesome. But I'm not making, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going up in space like I thought I was, but it's okay. I think <laughs> which teachers you get as growing up though is really important. It's what makes the difference. And that's mm. what happened to me because I hated science. I hated math. Um, and I had amazing teachers in high school that changed that for me. And math and science is my thing. Like I breathe it. I, I live it. I eat it. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I, I, don't, I don't know what would have happened if I went all the way up to a PhD in that. I, mean, I would have gone insane, I think. But uh, you could keep yeah, changing. I'd, I'd say I like science and I'm really nerdy. I'm just yeah. not academic. <laughs> Oh, I, I don't like that. The, I don't like the hierarchy thing as well. And <laughs> you know, it's, some of it's not practical. Some of it's only yeah. theory. It is, yeah. And it's it's also the way that it's taught is outdated. So that's that's what I, I try to work on is changing it up to make it the fun that it actually is. Oh. It can be fun. I never thought I'd say the science is fun. <laughs> Physics is fun. <laughs> Food safety is fun. Food safety is fun. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Harpooning stingrays is fun. Yeah, that's what I just said. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, I also asked this question, and I can't wait to hear your answer just because I know you enough to know that it's going to be a great answer. This is something that a little girl asked me when she was interviewing uh, adults for a school project, and nobody was answering her, and she got all excited when I answered her. So the question is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I love that question. Well, yes. actually, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a TV presenter. Ooh. So I'm probably going towards that being a presenter of some kind and a speaker. That's nice. I just don't, I don't want to grow up is probably the <laughs> most accurate answer. Yeah. Yeah. That's a thing. And I you don't, don't have to, to, which is quite a revelation. <laughs> that's right. I think that that's when you know you've made it as an adult is when you realize you don't actually, this is my personal opinion, you actually realize you don't have to grow up. You can stay, you can nurture that that, that inner child in you for forever. Yeah, and go towards the things that light you up and it feels like yeah. play. Yes. If you can earn a living doing that, then you're going to do really well. You're doing great. Yeah. Now, what what are you working on now? What's new for you? Uh, I'm just thinking that's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is. It really is a good because we yes. ask children this all the time. But it, yeah, what do you what are you up to I'm, now? I'm working with a, a few like accountability. They're actually business coaches, so it's actually yeah. good for me that I've got this accountability buddy. So I'm <laughs> actually working on trying to produce more content and ways for people to learn this that mm. I don't have to work the hours like I'd have to do one-to-ones or I could do courses or nice. teach people in a different alternative way to I don't want to do reading you know <laughs> so yeah. the book's great but then I want to have it in all the other formats where people can learn it better so that's what I'm working on right now and I don't know how to do tech in an easy way so <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the, I'm in this learning process but it nice. will be like blogs and podcasts and ways to that's educate amazing. people really in a fun way yeah, I think it's important and a lot of people will be open to it as well, just if it's accessible. Um, I think I'm also working on it being more fun, like you say, and be more fun and more genuine and more probably mm. graphic in my, my sense of humour <laughs> comes out um, and bolder, like like yeah. you say, like it is about advocating for yourself and being, yeah. you know, entitled. In I've been called that, entitled in a negative way and I'm like, but I am entitled. Yeah, yeah, because it's a, it's it's for your health so yeah you should be entitled and uh, we mentioned we talked about this before we recorded as well that we, we need to be talking about the topics that people tiptoe around or that they, mm -hmm. they don't want to talk because it makes them feel uncomfortable and and yeah we need to be bold and graphic I'm, I'm the same I will give you I will paint you pictures you cannot unsee uh, but it's necessary sometimes to get to to understand for people to understand how serious this is and um and share stories because it's it exactly. provides comfort for the people that exactly other people are going through the same and they're not some freak with allergies they're not some exactly. you know exception to the rule they are actually entitled and it is possible yes. to be included yeah. in an easy way 
and it's not just them. They, there, there are other mm -hmm. people that are going through the exact same thing. Because when we don't talk about it, you really think there's something wrong with you. Like, why am I, you know? Yeah, it's a very but, in, in, invisible community, an invisible yeah. disability, or an invisible, you know, right that's getting violated. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love how you said that. Yeah, absolutely. it is a right that's being violated. And people who are not going through it should really remember that it is a, it's a right. Oh, and I think I talking talk about you. things, talking about things that are quite hard and traumatic, <laughs> but with massive amounts of humor, does help yeah. people in some way. That's right. That's right. It makes it more human. It makes it more uh, relatable as well. So I, I really and it's also, If you're going to suffer, you might as well get something out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got a good anecdote afterwards or a good story afterwards that's right stories are, stories are also entertaining even if it is even if it's and sad at the end of the day it's it's the best way to learn to i find that through storytelling and through sharing experiences i think you you learn more and graphic than... examples yes yes i like that <laughs> i love it i love it i love it <laughs> i could talk to you all day about yes. this but uh, uh i, I want to thank you so much for for coming on and, and sharing your experiences and uh shedding light a little bit on the importance and i invite everybody i will put uh heather's information on the, the description of this podcast so that they can follow you and subscribe and, and get those resources if they want to read up on it and uh, start talking about it, start uh, demanding your rights as a person who is not being difficult. Uh, and yes, you are entitled to your safety. So uh, thank you again. Uh, it's, so you mentioned uh, heatherlandex.com. Is there mm -hmm. other, uh, on LinkedIn as well, is there other venues that they can follow you? Your book, where can they get my your book? My book is on Amazon. <laughs> So if you Amazon. have the title, Inclusive, the new exclusive, my my name is like the only one on the internet. So that helps. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I'm think i inconsistent with social media, but you can find me on all of them. Okay. Even even TikTok, I gave a go for a while there. Nice. I'm gonna, I might do a bit more of that. It's quite fun. It is fun. It is a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. So I'll, I'll put that information in the description so people can, can get a hold of you and see the work that you do. And again, thank you again so much. And I, I really look forward to seeing what else you got out there and hearing more of your stories. Yes. Wonderful and, speaking uh, to you. It was wonderful. Yes. And for everybody who is listening or watching, don't forget again to like, follow and subscribe. And uh, don't forget to follow Heather as well on the, um, the amazing work that she does. And uh, until then, stay safe, stay awesome, and we'll talk soon.